Okay, so we're going to start up again. And we have a volunteer going before we go through. Volunteer. I just want to introduce Andrew Scholl from the Tau Foundation. They have started a residency program, and Andrew's going to sit in for the next rest of this for the next few days. So, and then Akiva Baca from our staff was here roaming around, but she seems to have left, so I was going to say introduce her. She's gone. And so, OSF. You're up, and I, I'm not gonna. I'm gonna kind of time, so I'll give you like a one minute wrap if, if it seems like it's going long. Oh my god! Hey, <laughs> 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 Like seeing him on the bricks talking to all sorts of different people, but also running into him uh, as he workshops to play in the Black Swan Lab, or as he, he wrote a piece for our annual aid benefit that we do each year that we build to this witnessing, remembering all the people that we lost. For the second year in a row, Louise wrote one of the pieces that builds us for that big event. Running into Louise at uh, helping other playwrights workshop their things, talk about their things. It's amazing the different ways that Louise is a part of it. Hi. And I'm the audience development manager at OSF, and it is my wonderful job to introduce OSF and also theater to new audiences, and also to um, enact a plan to get diverse audiences in OSF. And Luis is a godsend for community groups, for individuals. He exhibits why theater is important. Um, he exhibits joy, passion, content, playwriting skills. I get so many requests for us to um, have Luis as a speaker and to do workshops. It's wonderful, wonderful, wonderful to have Luis with us. Oh, and now I'm afraid to speak. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Luis, I'm of, I wanted to say just something very quick that Todd mentioned. I think the moment for me where everything changed and I knew I had a home was when I got my key. So I think that really did make a difference. I, I just wanted to say something really quick about the uniqueness of this organization. It's so huge that uh, 600 and something employees. So for me, going to department to department really kind of does take a year because to get real relationships with people, to really make events, to make uh, progress in a company like this, it would just uh, alone we have a diversity initiative and inclusion program where even that alone could take me a whole year, but it's been extraordinary just to meet everybody. But I will say that I had this sort of dream when we started, which was I always felt like I had two divorced parents, the Magic Theater in San Francisco and Oregon, uh, Oregon Shakespeare Festival. And so the suggestion was made that, you know, if I was going to really uh, write a play, could I, could I get my parents together? So one of the kind of amazing things that's happened is to get a smaller theater like the Magic along with uh, Oregon Shakespeare to co-commission my trilogy of plays has been maybe the best thing. Uh, so much stress has gone away. And so bringing Loretta Greco up from the magic to uh, Oregon, going down to San Francisco, it's been, you know, the stretch of the five Golden State Freeway is a kind of extraordinary trip anyway. And so I do it a lot because I feel like I'm, I'm connecting with my, uh, my mommy and my dad. So, uh, <laughs> You know, Luis is such a charismatic speaker, for those of you who've heard him speak. He's such a visionary, he's a community activist. He's been an artist <coughs> leader through so much of his career that the biggest challenge we're facing in the residency, honestly, is everybody wants a piece of him. Mm -hmm. And everybody wants him to talk to their group and their department and their thing. And uh, so actually carving out the time for us to spend together as artistic director and resident playwright and time for Luis to write has become a, a, a kind of the, the crisis of the residency. Um, and so we're really trying to work on that as we move into the next phase of the residency. The end. <laughs> Maybe who, who work for it. 
And as Todd was talking about artistic home and, and having a, a, your name on the office store, I was thinking that is like the last thing that I want my artistic home to be, would be to participate in, in, in that kind of way. I, I have a home. I love my home. I live in Minneapolis, and my child and my husband live at my home. And what I do <laughs> <laughs> our houses are 12 blocks from each other. <laughs> I actually, though, without the idea of home, I have found a place for my artistry, though, um, in uh, the chance to write for these amazing audiences, these big, uh, wildly diverse audiences. And it's made me feel useful and necessary as an artist, uh, which is, I think, a really profound thing. Um, so it's been a, a, a breakneck pace. I, I, writing three plays for the theater in three years. They, I write them and they produce them. So uh, that's been, I think, the most extraordinary thing is to, to get to imagine all of these audiences, non-traditional audiences, traditional audiences, to write and then, and then to have that conversation uh, with those audiences. So, so it's home for me has been, uh, I guess, a heart space and, and something very connected to the, the way my imagination uh, is engaging um, with a much bigger audience than I've ever had the privilege to write for. And I think a couple other things that make maybe our residency unique, besides being small and a theater without a building, um, is quite frankly we're friends. <coughs> we were friends before the residency. Kira did two plays for us before the residency even started, so we got a running start. Um, and quite frankly, because we're both women, and I will just say that as a woman director that directs lots of classical plays, it is such a relief to work with a playwright where there's not misogyny in her work and where we can just, we're on the same wavelength about our commitment, we understand who our audiences are, what kinds of stories we wanna tell to connect with them, and it's just sort of like, um, I feel like, it's been so cool about this residency. So is that Kira's written three plays in 18 months for us. We've done one, we did one last spring. The second one we'll be doing the next spring, and we'll be doing the third one the next spring. So we're gonna do all three. But the, the first play of the residency, Dirt Sticks, because Kira had written two before, we got this running start, and she just knew what she was doing, and it just clicked, and it landed, and it connected with all our different audiences in prisons and shelters and with our paying audiences. And so I think we both felt like, okay, cool, we're cooking, we're going somewhere. And we have a clear sense, I think, of where we want to go. And even after the residency, we're going to try to figure out a way to keep this, this cooking because it's, it's really, it's just so rewarding to see artistically, creatively, and as friends where this partnership's going. <coughs> And I had already worked with Susan and had a great experience so that I thought that I could, but the idea of what the Alliance has represented, this is not a theater that was started by a charismatic, charismatic artist. This is a theater that began um, as a part of Atlanta saying, if we're gonna be a world-class city, we gotta have a world-class theater, so let's get some businessmen to make this institution. Um, and it has been a place that has nurtured artists, but that's not the impetus that started it. So that when I began to think about whether or not I could do a residency like this, I was talking to my husband, and I was raised in a very black nationalist household on the west side of Detroit. And I said to him, I don't know if I can, as an independent black playwright, um, be in residence at the big white theater. And he listened to me talk, and he said, you know, you're looking at this all wrong. 
And I said, well, how is that? And he said, use American rather than the racial designations and see how it sounds. Because what you're really talking about is whether or not you can be a great American playwright at a great American theater, which was like a big revelation to me. Because if I could think about myself as an American playwright and this as an American theater, then of course I have every right to be there as an American playwright. I don't have to go in adversarial. I don't have to go in and slam Susan's door and talk to her as the white person. <laughs> I don't have to go in and bust at Chris Moses. I can go in as a great American playwright and speak to the great American artistic director about the mission, about the work, about what we're doing. And I don't have to go there continuing the relationship that I had at my beginning of this theater, um, which was when I used to pick at them for not using enough black actors in place when they could have used them. So that it, it actually has allowed me to not only think of myself as connected to a whole field of people, but also to think of myself as an integral part of this theater becoming an American theater that looks like America, that looks like Atlanta, that reflects all the things that are important to me. So it's been really wonderful um, for me for that. Go, man. Um, I'm Chris Moses, uh, education director, and just last month, I guess, uh, Susan um, named me the associate artistic director, and, and I think that's important uh, just as a testimony of what education means at the Alliance Theater, and, and that, that it's not this subsidiary thing, but it's always been core to the work of the place. And now, with that, that designation, it's kind of um, clear to, to all of our constituents. And um, Pearl is, is a huge part of that, because um, the way our, our building is set up, the third floor is all education and rehearsal halls. Fourth floor is the administration. And it's, it's telling that Pearl's home, her artistic home right now, is on the third floor with us in the education world. And one project um, that she works on every summer is the Collision Project, which is with high school students, um, where we charge 20 uh, teenagers from across Atlanta, from all walks of life, to come together here for three weeks. Um, and Pearl serves as the playwright in this project, where they collide with the classic text, take it apart, and create their own piece. And um, they, they write all of it, and Pearl then puts it together as a, an original piece for the community. And it's really probably the thing, we were talking, the three of us, that, that, that most perfectly reflects the Alliance Theater's mission. And that Pearl is there working on it, I think, um, is, is a gift, a real gift to the entire city. So, it, The reason that the Collision Project is uh, the manifestation of our mission, and the reason this is apropos of Pearl's residency, uh, it is it is theater not for theater's sake, it is theater to impact the community and to create a community. And whether this would have happened anyway, I have no way of knowing, but the, the luxury of the past few years of having as my closest collaborator a social justice-based civic activist artist makes a difference. And I would say what we're learning is that our task is to take the style of conversation that we've been developing over the past several years, which involves awkwardness, <laughs> which involves absolute truth, which involves a core tenet, which is white women don't cry when you talk about race. <laughs> 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 if we can translate the DNA of our artistic conversations into the DNA of the way the Alliance talks to Atlanta, then we will have done something. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what this residency is allowing us to pursue. I just want to say, just being in this room is so inspiring and amazing to be in this room with all these artists. It's just probably one of the main big gifts of this program is to just be able to sit here. Um, so I'm a South Coast rep. Uh, as was mentioned with Todd, home is a little bit of an issue for me. Uh, I'm a military brat, so like settling down is, is tough. 
So it's been interesting being at South Coast. Uh, I do have a plaque and I have a cubicle. And at first I was like, this cubicle, I can see everyone who passes by, I'll have no privacy. But I have a chair in that cubicle that has now become like, please come sit, just come sit and talk to me. Because, you know, it's very isolating to be a playwright and I feel like going there, part of my job is to just sit there and disrupt other people working. <laughs> and, I'm talking to them. and you know, I hear things about their daily lives that are just really wonderful. So that's got a huge bonus of going to SCR. It's an hour commute from my house, so I am going to the theater. It's not in my not in LA in my home, so that's you know, I have to when I go I'm there to hang out. Um, I'm doing a project based on the Pandora myth, engaging with older audience members, which is, I discovered as a challenge, I didn't realize really how hard it is for those old, older audience members to get to the theater. And so I'm still find, trying to find ways to get them there, or find ways to maybe go into their homes and interview them. Because really, I, I, I don't think that was clear to me in going in what it takes for some of them, that that may be their big day event is going to the theater. And so really to be aware of that. Um, anything you guys want to add? Well, I, I, you know, trying to figure out as an institution how to be responsive is one thing. And, and about four or five months ago, uh, I realized that, that we were not doing what Pearl had suggested to take the time to have the conversation so that I would always know uh, what the obstacles were that Julie was running into, um, whether they were institutional or whether they were just like, how do you get the old people to come to the theater so that they will talk to you kinds of things, which um, I think any of those obstacles can be addressed <coughs> if I'm aware. So. We did start, ours did not involve wine, it was salad. It was a salad based um, it's California. interaction. Um, and then we did, have, we did have a couple of wine or actually vodka based uh, conversations. Um, and that, that helped. So I think the learning for me was that I needed to be more mindful and deliberate about taking the initiative to say, what do you need on a regular basis so that we can then provide it. And I think some positive things came out of that. We, we've done readings of Julie's work. We'll do more of that. You know, there are other things not directly related to, to the Pandora project that, that I think we can uh, continue to do. Um, so, it, you know, it's a, it's a, there's a lot going on for us right now. We have two huge community-based projects, and Julie has a background in that. Julie's been useful in staff meetings and in other places in speaking up for independent artists and advocating for how we can be uh, more welcoming to people and, and uh, uh, create the right kind of impression when artists do engage with us. Um, so, you know, that's kind of where we are. We're, we're still learning two years in um, how to make the residency work. Well, I want to say one thing that, you know, it's been interesting because I'm used to my work being what represents me. The work guides the conversation and now I'm having to, I have, my, I represent myself and that's been a really new challenge. It's like, oh, it's me. It's not, here's my play and we're all going to gather around the work, but I have to, and that's been a real adjustment as a playwright actually. So that's been really interesting. Um, advocating both for, my, for artists, just for artists sake and for, and to represent myself. Isn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> my name is Lisa, I'm our artistic director of these space in San Francisco. And um, I think one of the surprises, there are two things that I guess I want to just quickly say is that um, I've always uh, thought of Peter as a peer and a, and a dear friend of mine. We had a relationship before this residency, and Peter's a native San Franciscan. Um, so it is home to him in many ways. Uh, he has a key and a uh, code to our alarm. He doesn't have a door or a plaque because none of us have a door or a plaque. <laughs> <laughs> we did write his name on his desk, though, in Magic so Marker. Peter and Sharpie. Yeah. <laughs> and we drink bourbon together. Yeah. Um, but, uh, 
There's a bottle on my desk waiting for the last day of year three to be open. Yeah. Um, but I, I think the other thing that, that was interesting for me is that I really look to Peter as an advisor. Um, there are issues that come up fr from an artistic director's perspective that I went to Peter and I said, I'm having some issues with an artist or a playwright. How would you deal with these? As a playwright, how would you want an artistic director or director or anybody to, to talk to you in this situation? And can you help me think through this? Can you help me articulate it so when I go to the artists, I have that perspective embedded in me? So that's been a really um, important thing for me. Uh, I, and the other thing is, um, which I'm maybe not so proud of, um, I'm a yes person and uh, I'm very artist-centric. And um, I think the hard thing for me was to allow Peter to see the struggles, the financial struggles of an organization. And um, I like to shield my artists from that. And he's seen it. He's seen everything. He's seen the nakedness of the struggles. Um, and, you know, sitting down and just, we're producing his play this coming uh, November. And he hears the conversations where I'm like, I got to cut the budget. We have to do this. Can we help, help me find housing? <laughs> you know, all of these things where in, generally I would like to shield my artists from ever having to hear or participate in those conversations. So in that way, it's felt, um, I feel in some ways I've let him down by having to have those conversations in front of him, but he's still with us. <laughs> <laughs> now, I actually get really excited about those conversations and, um, and, and being invested in the whole product. So, I mean, my production's coming up this fall, and I'm really looking forward to making it the most, most whatever, successful production it, it can be in, in all senses of the word, creatively and and for the community and I guess one of the things that I really liked is that, that when we when I came in um, there was no specific obligation put upon me as far as how to engage with Z space other than with these other than not, uh, writing plays and hoping they, they'll do them which is still my primary activity there but all the other sort of facets of being part of an organization Lisa essentially left it up to me to design what that is, and it's a question I'm still grappling with, is what is a playwright in residence? What can they contribute without losing the playwright? Um, and just assuming sort of tasks, um, but wanting to engage in all aspects of a, of a theater. So that's actually been really, really exciting. Also been really exciting to be there at a time where, where the organization is I mean, Lisa mentioned struggles, but it's also it's a, it's a time of, of growth. Of um, the theater uh, uh, took control of a second space, which is actually the size that is perfect for a show that I would write. Um, and being part of the programming, programming of that, and learning how this group can grow in San Francisco, and, and that's that's been really exciting to see the dreams of a of a company um, really high and pushing pushing forward through the uh, slog, muddy slog of nonprofit life. So that's, it's been really exciting to be there uh, for that. And it's only 20 minutes from my apartment, which I also really appreciate. <laughs> 20 <laughs> minutes walk. Yeah, yes, yeah. 20 minute walk, yes. Laura, I don't know if you want to You guys pretty much hit it. Yeah. All right, we'll go next. Um, I'm Sarah Benson, the artistic director of Soho Rap. And this, David doesn't like being video, so I'm gonna talk. Um, and Raf's here to our director of new work, so chime in if I forget anything. Um, so when we were just kind of talking and really thinking through how to summarize, you know, what's been really distinctive for us, I think the main thing is that David has really um, transformed the sort of civilian creativity bleed at our theater and encouraged everyone in the building, everyone who interfaces with Soho Rep to think of themselves as a creative being and to encourage creativity to kind of flow through the capillaries of absolutely everything that happens, whether that's our staff, our board, um, and everyone who's coming to see our shows. Um, and that sort of manifests, you know, it, it's manifest in a number of ways. Um, but it's really jived with a lot of our long-term goals and things that David and I have been talking about for a long time. 
um, just in terms of sort of throwing open the doors of the theatre and having innovative form and wild accessibility not being mutually exclusive, um, which is a big um, kind of project of mine. Um, so, yeah, some of the main ways that I think it's manifested is through these amazing creativity workshops that David's been giving um, that um, form around basically people writing a play. Um, and putting themselves in the role of the, of the artist. Um, he's, he did one at first for our whole staff and board, um, and then around Marie Antoinette, he did a public one. And then it kind of grew into this whole festival that Raphael um, curated called Write With Us, where we had writers come and give these you know, huge um, workshops for, um, for people, like the theater was just overflowing with people who'd never um, many of them had never been into a theatre building before, let alone written a play, and it's really kind of transformed um, who's coming into the building, who thinks of themselves as an art maker, um, and it's expanding class diversity in a big way, which has been really important to us for a long time. Um, we've done a lot of work with the local community college, BMCC, which also came directly out of the work with David. Um, what else? I mean, I think that David's writing, which was always the thrust of the residency, has sort of infused everything. Um, we started the residency with his Marie Antoinette, and we're planning to finish it with Stereophonics. So those are these two kind of big temples um, that a lot of activity has kind of formed around. Um, but there's also been like dinners with board members and um, you know, really strong one-on-one -on -one relationships that David's forged with, um, with Raph and with Cynthia at the theatre. So, yeah, I feel like those have been some of the, the main ways that David's really transformed how everything that happens at Soho Rep is a creative act, whether it's sort of like what Howard was saying, whether it's, you know, how we um, communicate our show to people or raise money for it, um, everything's become... Or even how we do the residency. I'll or just say one thing with, with my sh shyness, my camera shyness. <laughs> I will say, no, because I'm very inspired by what everyone's saying, but, you know, one of the things that we really struggled with in the beginning was, like, how do you do this? I mean, everyone, we all have the same thing. Like, how... My, I'm, my writing is my job, so that's what I'm going to do. But then I'm in residence, but what does that mean exactly? And we've really taken it sort of as a, f a philosophical problem, and we're not really... Um, we're approaching it rigorously, but we're also approaching it sort of um, like Anne Bogart would say, with soft eyes. Like we're not hitting the bullseye direct on, we're looking awry so that we can really do it the way I do my plays, which is I don't write a play going, here's my action, here's my obstacle, okay, now character, do this. You know what I mean? It's not, um, we're not approaching it like um, in a bureaucratic way. And we're really yeah. allowing ourselves to sort of give ourselves breathing space and fail and feel weird and awkward with each other and with what our process is and what are we trying to do and what's even the objective. We're yeah. trying to like, to listen and organically find an objective that feels right for what we're doing and really come upon real, real authentic discoveries together. Yeah, because I think at first we were like, what's the locus of the residency in terms of place and in terms of the relationship? And it felt like we were failing. And then I think we kind of went back to the, um, the origin of our relationship, which was as writer-director, as artists. And sort of that energy of the rehearsal room um, has really kind of infused, I think, how we've ended up finding a way to develop this deep connectedness. Um, so... Yeah. Anything else that I forgot? So, so many things. But we so can't many say them. things. So it's yeah, stuff. it's been very kind of prismatic, I would say. Um, anything else? We're one room with five desks, and David has been able to. He he comes in and hangs <coughs> out when he's in town, and it's this sort of filling in the negative space around the residency <laughs> um, in a wonderful way, you know. And that is sort of it's like a magic eye. Then the residency pops out. From that. But real estate, I think, has been a real challenge, mm -hmm. I will say, don't you think? Yeah. Real estate of our office, just that there's, you know. And like yeah. I was saying to Sarah, like every time I go in there, everyone, it's f so f everyone's like making phone calls and like, With, like, yeah. like everyone is really um, scraping by every single day and everyone's resources are tapped all the time. And in the beginning, I would come in and go, oh my God, like I better like back against the wall. You know what I mean? It was so, everyone is working so hard. And I was thinking, I don't want to just like knock on someone's, excuse me, I want to do the residency now. You know what I mean? So, 
So, I mean, that was a thing, and I'm very, yeah. you know, and like Julie was saying, I mean, I know I'm talking a lot, but what Julie was saying before about, you know, um, getting used to having your suitcases, you know, I'm very sort of, you know, you know, if it's a dating thing, I'm sort of like not gonna, I'm gonna like wait for the other person to call, you know what I mean? I'm not gonna barge in and demand stuff and start saying, here I am, you know, so the dance of figuring out how to engage with them has, you know, we're both, we're all sensitive. Everyone that works at this place is really sensitive to each other. And so it's just been this interesting dance of trying to figure out, okay, you know, don't be shy. You know, one time Sarah took me out and said, David, you know, everyone wants you around, everyone loves you. And I was like, they do. And that <laughs> feeling of like, not why? You know what I mean? Like, what do I bring to this? What am I, what am I bringing David to the table as a person, not just as plays, the pages that I hand to you? It's a very interesting, very, very interesting dynamic. All right, great. So what makes our residency at Dallas Theater Center distinct? I think it's three main areas. So the first area for me is that I have moved to Dallas with my wife, with our children, with our dog, Goldie. <laughs> and I'm getting to know the city and engaging in the city, not just as a playwright in residence, but also as a parent. Um, I'm also teaching at SMU, so as a teacher, as a spouse, as someone is running an errand. And so when I'm thinking about programming, for example, Dallas Playwrights Workshop, which I found it came out of this understanding of knowing different writers in different areas that I wouldn't necessarily know if I was just at the theater center. So my daughter takes classes at South Dallas Cultural Center, which is a center in South Dallas where it's a primarily African-American community. And so my, my son didn't want to take classes there, so we're playing chess in the lobby. And while we're playing chess, I'm meeting the copywriter person, the artist, oh, my cousin's a writer. And so I'm able to kind of engage the city in different access points. So that's one thing that I think is really, really exciting and distinct. The second thing is that Dallas Theater Center, they have, have kind of welcomed me into the, the, I would say, a leadership position. And so I'm part of the decision-making process. So I've been in the interview process. I've interviewed some key positions, including the general manager. I've contributed to, there's a big diversity initiative that's going on. We've just instituted the Rooney Rule, which is really exciting. And I'm on the diversity committee, and I lead a subcommittee. And the subcommittee I lead is the one that's responsible for sharing information with the 70-member company. So my committee, I have to figure out, okay, how are we going to disseminate this information? Which is really exciting for a playwright to be in that position for the whole, the whole company. Um, I'm also engaging with the board and doing that kind of thing. So that's really, really exciting too. And the third thing I would say is, you know, I've done a lot of work with music and I've done a lot of solo work and a lot of different kind of things. But this new piece I'm doing, Stagger Lee, is like a big, it's like a, a better word, it's just like a big musical, you know? And, that, <laughs> and it's like, you know, people coming out of manhole, Stagger Lee, you know, all that kind of thing. <laughs> and, you know, and you know, they, Dallas Theater Center has been so supportive of my writing. It's not co-pro alone. They're producing this. 18 cast members. There's a seven person, maybe eight person. I'm trying to push the lead. We'll see. <laughs> With a horn, horn section, you know, orchestrated. So it's a real traditional function. And so they've been very supportive. And we've been very active. And I've been very involved in raising that money. So we started a Staggerly Society. So I'm going around and I'm learning. I'm learning how to fundraise. I'm learning mm -hmm. about these kind of things. And it's been... It's been just a fascinating, powerful experience for me to just understand not just the theater center, but the whole city and to try to have an impact on the whole region. So, anything you guys want to add? To? No, I would just say that I think it's been interesting for our community in Dallas where we don't have a large number of full-time professional uh, mid-career playwrights in, in the city. It's been exciting, I think, for, for us to have will building personal, unique, authentic relationships throughout the community. For most people on our board, on our staff, our audience, and the folks who aren't necessarily Dallas Theater Center stakeholders or just members of the community, they don't necessarily have the kind of personal relationships with playwrights that our artistic staff and our production staff has with all the guest writers who come in and out as we do new work. So that's been really really different uh, instead of our community meeting a playwright on opening night at the end of their time in the city just as they're preparing to leave and not come back for another year or two until their next play comes up. Uh, instead to have that relationship be just the organic lived in experience is, um, that's, that's really different for us. And it opens up a lot of exciting possibilities. Uh, when I started in Chicago, 
say. Uh, our original, we had a lot of great ideas of what we wanted to do at the theater. And, uh, and I felt great because I was moved to Chicago and I felt like finally I had a home and I was getting married. And, uh, and then a couple of months after the residency started, uh, various theaters, quite a few, quite a number of theaters called me and they wanted to date me. I'm open. <laughs> and it was great because he said, let me look at your calendar. And because he's also you know, a playwright and a director, he was really open to, he wanted me to have all the opportunities that were available to me, which was really, really great and a big gift. And I thought, I couldn't do it, I can't, I don't know if I can do it, this year's going to be really crazy. And he just grabbed me and he said, you can do this. Is this what you want? You can do it. And he made space and time for me. It was an amazing thing. And uh, I got real busy during February, really <laughs> busy. And I thought I really could, I really can't make it. And he was there. He, he actually directed another show outside the theater with me. And so he's become even a closer friend, but also a really great advisor, which I didn't even see coming. And it's been a really great experience. And in Chicago, uh, we're going to be dedicated. The theater is dedicated to three works for three years. Uh, we did one, which is a big success. And we're going to. I've written a play for this season. And we're already talking about the next play, the next season. It's just been a really great gift. And being in Chicago, which I thought I would have no time to do, I've actually been there longer and spent more time there than I thought was possible. And we just kind of scratched everything we planned and let opportunities grow out of what we were already doing. And it's become even bigger than what we originally planned, which is really amazing. So we did a show there. I, I was there, and I wanted to do a show about the ball scene. And I was interviewing people, because that's a really important part of my process when I make a play. And people want to talk about gun violence. And so it's like drag queens and wigs. No, I'm going to talk about gun violence, which is really amazing. It's like, let's talk about the drag queens and the wigs. No, let's talk about the gun violence, because that's what's happening now. We're going to talk about that now. And so I changed, and I met with Jane. He says, yeah, let's talk about, we want to change, change the story, and we want to talk about gun violence. And so all of a sudden, I was in it, and now people really were waiting to talk about it. And then the subject became, they were like, and then the topic changed. And a lot of people question, well, why are you, why should you be telling this story? You're not from here. And so home became a different, different meaning for me, and it became really important because I needed to find a place and need to find a way in, which was really hard, but also uh, really encouraging. And I felt like they took me in and embraced me and honored me. And uh, so we did this piece, and uh, you know, I write theater because I really want to spark dialogue amongst audiences, which is really the most important thing for me. And the conversations after, because each show has a post-show discussion, were really powerful. Some people got angry, some people uh, got really upset, and uh, but you know, we did something to that city. The play was doing something in the city, and it gave people a space to talk about some things that they had not been able to talk about before. And a really powerful thing happened where some uh, uh, a cousin that I didn't know I had in Chicago, last name Gartley emailed me and said, uh, all right, is this your play? We heard about this play. And I said, yeah, I said, you should come see it. And so two dozen of them, Garthens, came. <laughs> I got real nervous because they all need a cop. <laughs> so I really knew they were Garthens. And, uh, and the theater was like, yeah, we'll just comp them because they're related to you and they need to see the work. And I've actually become real close with them. So it's been a home again. The meeting changed again, which is really, really powerful. And um, I'm so excited about the next play. And, and I've also started uh, with the theater, a local writers group with local writers there. And uh, that's growing, and I'm really excited about that. And then probably the most important thing that has started is this program called Inspired Eaglewood. We bus some of the young people from uh, what is considered one of the most violent neighborhoods in Chicago to the play. They had never seen the play before. All they knew about theater was Tyler Perry. And so I, talk, I met with them before the show and we talked. And I could tell they really want to see a Tyler Perry play. Because <laughs> I don't do that. And uh, they saw the play and they stayed. They wouldn't leave. The bus was out there waiting. They, they wouldn't leave. They wanted to talk about you know, some of the things in the play. And uh, from that moment, we, I've, I've been, been back quite a few times. And we're starting a little theater group with these young people mm -hmm. in Chicago. And so uh, I really have embraced, or have, I guess my, what I want to share with you is I had to change what I thought home could be. And, uh, and it's going to always change, because that's really what home is, is that you kind of have to let home be what it's 
what the other family members think they should be and being open to that process. Mm -hmm. Uh, I guess I can. Uh, Is Greg done? Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, I just want to make sure Jen's on the screen. Jane, you want to add anything? Great, great. Go on. Um, uh, yeah, I, uh, I'm Howard Shell. Uh, I'm the artist director for Robert O'Hara, uh, Mary Weisfeld. I'm going to take the lead here because they told me I had to, and that's sort of how it goes. Um, it's the top down, and it really is the bottom. It goes the other way. Um, but um, distinctive elements may be that Robert is both a playwright, director, was already a company member, so it's a lot of different roles. Um, and I feel like it's like this constantly complex and shifting set of relationships and authority structures, depending on those different roles. And I don't know, somehow we seem to navigate all that pretty easily. Um, the, I, I think that's because Robert's also a director, it's opened up a bunch of possibilities that maybe some playwrights wouldn't have, you know, like directing a season preview event, and we, we want him to direct more than we can get the time from him. Um, but I also think it's meant even more pressure on Robert's time, probably similar to what Marcus is going through, but in, in Robert's case, a kind of dual track of both a, di a national directing career, now increasingly a national playwriting career, some of which is growing out of successes at Woolley, and then still trying to juggle, um, still trying to juggle zombie and and the other projects he's working on at Woolley. So I, I think it's, um, it's, the time pressure is like the hardest, I would say, part uh, of juggling, juggling all that. Um, we've made it even worse because we've added a small kind of producing role, and I shouldn't say small, but we've identified one project each season where Robert's gonna do as much of mine's and Miriam's job as he possibly can, um, so that we don't have to do it. <laughs> and so, uh, and, uh, and um, so then, you know, that's a, a whole other different kind of authority stru stru structure that we kind of juggle on those projects. Maybe an example of kind of those complex roles. Um, I really didn't find out until just about uh, outside when we were talking that, um, I mean, Robert came to me and asked me if I would direct Zombie, um, which is the big play that's at the center of this residency, but I didn't find out till just now that really he and Miriam cooked that up together first, <laughs> and, and, then, and then I was the unwitting. Uh, I just stepped into it. Um, <laughs> um, so that is how it goes. Um, uh, someone mentioned staff transitions, and that's kind of interesting, because actually the moment you, the residency started, we lost our production manager, and then shortly after that, our literary manager, and now very recently we've been through a managing director search. Uh, and a connectivity director. So Robert's been basically part of the interview team for all of those. So that's been like a, a deep immersion in, in sort of personnel stuff um, at the theater. Obviously, Robert plays a huge role in season planning, scouting for plays, but that's had a lot of unexpected outcomes as well. Like, I think one of the plays you learned about through the, um, our season planning process was Marie Antoinette, David's play. Um, a, a, a different director is doing it at Woolley because he'd been involved in reading it earlier, Yuri Ernoff, but then Robert ended up pitching it to Steppenwolf and is directing it there. Mm -hmm. So it's like a lot of complicated pathways yeah. that lead into and out of, out of these, um, out of these residencies, and then maybe just some other thing to reflect on is some interesting ways in which I guess Robert's voice as a writer and a, as an artist starts to almost become the face of the theater in interesting ways. Like, I don't know, when did you say everyone is welcome, no one is safe? Oh, it was, yeah, right, we were talking about how do we talk about what we can. And Robert said everyone is welcome and no one is safe, and we just all like pounced on it, and it became like the big, uh, the big lettering as soon as you entered the theater, outside and inside the theater for about a year. And then um, we knew that Let the Meat Cake uh, was gonna kind of frame our season this year um, because of, we were opening with David's play, Marie Antoinette. And I don't know, Robert had this idea that it, it could be a different a substitute for cake for every show. <laughs> so it ended up being let them eat cake, and then worms, and then s'mores, and then love, and then brains. Let them eat brains for zombie, the American. So yeah, it's like, <laughs> kind of full circle. Do you guys have stuff, stuff to add? They, they forced me, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, um, my name is Mackenzie Goodwin. I'm the Commons producer at the Kansas City Repertory Theater with uh, Nathan Jackson and our artistic director, Eric Rosen. Uh, I just, I'll start off by saying that there are so many wonderful things and confluences about having Nathan at the Kansas City Repertory Theater. Nathan is from Kansas City and is able to engage with the community in so many different ways. Um, the first play that was produced at Kansas City Repertory Theater of his is Brokeology, which is about a family in Kansas City. 
Um, also, the, through the education department, he's been able to visit so many different schools and even connect with his alma mater, who came to a talk back of a play of his that uh, was produced at the Rep recently. Um, also, it's been wonderful to see, and jump in. Um, <laughs> and also, it's been, it's been wonderful to see how the integration with the staff has happened because we have Eric Rosen, the artistic director, as a playwright, also the associate artistic director, Kyle Hatley, um, who is actually moving to Chicago and is stepping into a role more as um, resident director, but still is very involved with the residency. He originally uh, directed uh, Brokeology, was, which was the first play Nathan uh, did at the, at the rep. Um, but the, he is also a playwright, so we had playwrights sort of in these positions. And so what Nathan has been able to, to teach the theater, I think, through marketing, through education, through all of these different aspects of this, you know, very large regional theater is what was lacking in terms of supporting um, a playwright in residence. And so because of that, that has led to this wonderful shift um, in focus where it had been becoming more artist-centered as an institution, um, it has become even more so, and it has inspired uh, the theater to, and has now gotten a grant uh, to make a whole new position at the theater for as a new works director, um, somebody to support, uh, directly in charge of uh, new plays that are being produced. Because I mean, Kansas City audiences aren't as used to new works; they're a little bit skittish about new plays. Um, and so they're becoming less so as they're engaging with Nathan, as they're engaging with Kyle and Eric's work, and there are so many new playwrights in Kansas City who feel like that is a place that they can produce new works and people won't be as, as frightened to, to go see it and to engage with it and to feel like they can connect with it as part of their community. I'd say just uh, talking boring, about boring strategic planning, <laughs> Everyone's favorite. Uh, when I've been in, at the theater seven years, uh, and this is our 50th anniversary season, and um, we, so we're the same age as the country, and we're the same age as Seattle Rep and, uh, and, uh, and Arena Stage. We're part of that founding moment, but the Rep had never had a uh, sort of moment uh, uh, as a national theater. And my charge when I came in was to, was to build a strategy around new work as the catalyzing event that would uh, lift the theater into, uh, into national prominence while deepening our roots in Kansas City. This grant for us uh, was a huge catalyzing event. It's part of a larger seven-year conversation about how to shift the theater from being an importer of all of our work to becoming an exporter of, 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 of the things that we could do in Kansas City. What Nathan has given is, is a face to our board, to our community, to, uh, um, and. Uh, to people, literary managers around the country who know him uh, to take us seriously as a new place theater. It's also initiated a campaign, uh, what we can, was speaking about, we're raising, uh, we're in the silent phase of a $25 million campaign for all kinds of things, but we're dedicating over 10% of the campaign to playwrights and new work. And we, were, and we got our first half million dollar grant uh, in the summer that's enabling not just a position, but um, uh, but ongoing residency money, ongoing uh, uh, commissioning, ongoing uh, production and development of, of work, and that will ultimately be a $2.5 million fund. So that is, um, I think, what's been most interesting to me is, is how the legitimizing impulse for a theater that most of you had never heard of before uh, uh, we started doing this work with you a couple of years ago um, has put us on a path towards institutional stability, it's put us on a path towards uh, um, uh, uh, cre creative richness, and it's uh, been all through the strategy of placing artists, including writers, directors, director writers, uh, dramaturgs, uh, producers, um, at the center of every decision that's made. And Nathan's been a, hu a huge and vital part of that, um, and that's really been a, a massive organizational transformation over the last seven years, and given us kind of our direction for the next. Nathan? Uh, I know we're short on time. I'm just going to say, because as she said, there's so many wonderful things. So I'll just say my three favorite moments. Uh, we were doing education. Education has become a big part of the grant. There was a, you know, a young boy running the school's mama mater who didn't do any work. So the teacher's job is literally 
She said, I just don't want him to cuss anybody out today. <laughs> so she just gets him not to cuss people out, he gets F's, and he just stays there until he's 17 and can decide not to go to school. Hadn't done a thing all week long. Doesn't talk to you, puts his head down, mumbles curse words. He mumbled me and my actor friend. We worked, we worked, and at the end of the, this period, he did his first assignment and written a short play about a page and performed the play and was the only A he got all year long. <laughs> and to us, that meant a lot. So, so we, we continue education has been a, been a big part. Two, uh, we read like eight pages of a play that I was like, I don't know if this is any good or not. We read this reading, Eric came in, uh, eight pages. Eric was like, I liked it. And then now it's on the season. So the faith that Eric showed, you know, like, I was like, that's sweet, dude. <laughs> that was great. Uh, and then three, I shouldn't even say, but like all that good things happened, all those good things were happening in the after opening. I think you came to the opening probably. And we had a great night. We went out the night afterwards. And this terrible, horrible, like, I don't want to say nothing on the, the scale of Ferguson, but this thing happened at this bar that made me think that we, I still got a lot of stuff to write about. <laughs> and no matter how wonderful all these other things are, not just me, but the community that now I've established myself in, we still got to fight. Uh, we got a long way ahead of us. So it was a, it was a terrible but good grounding uh, uh, incident that happened that, that made me think and, and, and made me, it pushes me forward. So. Yeah, I was going to say we're right next to you. We'll go next. Um, so I'm Susanna Pell. I'm the managing director at Cutting Ball, and I'm going to do all the bragging that our artistic director, Bob Melrose, would do about Andrew if he were here today. And um, I think the, the big thing that really started our residency off with a big kick was that um, the, we did the first full, fully produced play of Andrew's work um, three months after Andrew started his residency. Not, maybe not even three months. I think we started in March. Two, yeah, it was two, it opened two and a half months. In May, yeah, so two and a half months later we premiered um, uh, Crispy Critters in the Scarlet Night. And so I think that initial, and in just really diving right into the artistic relationship with Tony Andrew and Rob, I know was really critical for, for um, on Rob's side, and I think for Andrew's too, just in beginning that, um, that, the deepening of that artistic relationship right away. And then the truly extraordinary thing is that not only did, you know, did Andrew begin by doing millions of rewrites of that play before it opened, but then has started, he had, I think, five other plays that were, um, he had sort of like little germs of pieces of them, and he's completed all of those and another full, full per play that we're gonna be producing in our current season. So he has seven red plays that are basically production ready within the first year and a half of this residence, which just, the volume of that work is just kind of staggering. Um, and in addition to that, he's doing, he's writing two additional new plays this year, which we're developing in Ariscus this series, and is done, but we'll have completed two translations also by the end of this year. So it's, um, so Andrew's doing a lot of work. We're making the most of the residency we possibly could. But I, I also think, um, you know, from a managing leader perspective, we see that as being a gift um, that we can give to Andrew at this point in his career and that he's really taking advantage of as a, early, a playwright who's in a slightly earlier point in his career, being able to leave the residency with all of these plays to um, go have produced not just at our theater but at other theaters is really extraordinary. And Andrew's taken a lot of time to do a lot of research on that work that I really want him to talk about. So I, tomorrow or the next time I'm going to Nantucket for the, not quite a week to do my start my research for my very experimental guide lab that benefits from Moby Dick, thanks to the um, the flexible fund, playwright funds that we all have next to the Nolan Foundation. And about this time last year, I spent a lot of time in um, D.C. and Maryland, and I went to Woolley and Edward Howard and saw a show there, and, and that was to do. Uh, a lot of hands-on research for Mount Misery, which you heard an excerpt of, which Rob is directing next year. And I went to the Pentagon, where Rumsfeld worked for six years. I um, went to, they took the Frederick Douglass historic tour on the Eastern Shore, and a lot of details that are in the play came out of that time there, and so it was just being in, the, in these areas. And so that was, a, I like to do immersive research um, before I begin plays that they required that it end. So that's been a huge blessing is to really um, get, you know, get down into it. So for example, 
jellyfish, or technically they're called sea nails, are a recurring image in um, Mount Misery, and are perhaps somewhat, well, we'll figure out if it's credible or contrived, but they become the time travel mechanism by which uh, Rumsfeld and Douglas both get stunned by jellyfish, and then they can see each other. <laughs> <laughs> And that wouldn't have happened if I hadn't gone to, um, you know, the Eastern Shore and been looking out at the Chesapeake Bay and saw all of these jellyfish just floating down the quite polluted waterway. Um, I tried to meet with Rumsfeld. Um, there was a while I was in the letter you got. Oh, I, so Polly Carl very generously on my behalf wrote to his press secretary. And we would love <laughs> if Robinson would be open to um, having an interview. And I praised him. He voted in favor of all of LBJ's civil rights initiatives when he was in Congress in the 60s. And I, I was basically saying, trying to, you know, say how much, how admirable Robinson was. <laughs> and it was a way to get an interview. And his press secretary not only gave the most, um, somehow spun that into, into you know, that I had written a negative letter because, wow. oh, I had some facts wrong. And they said, no, Rumsfeld never lived. Uh, it was, it's not the same property. The New York Times and The Economist reported that incorrectly. And so the, the beautiful thing about that is I actually have Rumsfeld in the first pages of the play denying that it's the same property. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm going to put that letter in our program. Be cool. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and then um, Ren's going to talk a little bit about the way Andrew's work is some of our other yeah, finally, I'm Cam Rem, I'm the associate producer at Cutting Ball. Um, so in addition to everything that Susan and Andrew have talked about, uh, Andrew has helped um, and done a great deal of bringing in other fantastic new playwrights uh, for readings and productions. I'm talking about playwrights like Basil Crimadol, um, Crimadol, uh, Jen Silverman, Kat Sherman, helping uh, bring these playwrights in. Uh, Andrew would work with these uh, wonderful artists in developing their own work. Um, and right now, the play we're producing this fall, um, Andrew is dramaturging for that show, um, helping develop that show as well. So in addition to uh, writing all of his own work, in addition to traveling, he's also has the time to help out other artists develop their own work, which is just fantastic. Andrew Sacco. <laughs> <laughs> How about um, uh, Huntington over there? Shall I start? Yeah, okay. Um, well, Melinda is our playwright in residence, and really the focus has been uh, this year on producing her play Becoming Cuba, which Bevan O'Gara, our associate producer, directed. Um, and I guess the one thing I would say that maybe isn't immediately apparent in the statements is um, what a valuable voice Melinda's been in season programming, and just having a playwright in the room who's not carrying all the institutional baggage that the rest of the artistic staff is carrying is amazing, you know, because there's just a purity to the opinion and the thought, and Melinda will just be like, I fucking love this play, and, 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 here's, and here's why. And, and um, so I, I look at it with a different eye, and then I guess I would say from, from my point of view, um, the other thing that's been great is, you know, when, as an artistic director, when you're going into, we do so much new work, at the Huntington, it's, it's, it's at the center of, of what we're most passionate about. And you're going into a director playwright relationship uh, when you're doing a new play um, that you know, you're coming into something really intimate. And um, what's amazing about having Melinda on the staff is I get to come into that conversation and it's just a continuation of the day. It's just us, the play becomes somehow slightly more objective and, and the conversation becomes easier um, because, you know, Bevan's her director, and, and, um, and it's just this extended conversation, so that's been a, a beautiful benefit. Um, uh, I guess I'd say, you know, my residency is structured with, I have complete freedom. I think that's the thing that strikes me, and I have just to underscore. Um, so, uh, I ha have been able to intensify and develop this wonderful relationship with Bevan O'Gara, who's like a bright shining star on the horizon that the world will know her soon. Um, that I get to see her every day, as well as work on cool projects. And so, you know, you're talking about extending that artistic relationship into the everyday. 
I feel like I come to the theater offices and I get to work with my friends all the time. So, I mean, that's an incredible blessing. I, you know, I've been a part of that theater for over 10 years. So, you know, I've worked as a playwright there, I've worked as an actress there, I've been on the board there, and so I have many long-standing relationships with many different um, departments and board members, and um, as well as, um, you know, this incredible um, literary department that's um, uh, lit a fire under new play development and that's, that's, that's turned up the burner under every theater in Boston. I can't, I'm hard pressed to think of a theater now that doesn't have something going on with new play development, reaching out to new playwrights, and uh, I would draw that line directly back to this theater. So um, having a resident playwright is new, but it doesn't feel new. Um, the thing that I've learned, a couple of things. One is, you know, being this conversation of. I'm a writer, but who am I if I'm not a writer? How do I tell the world who I am? Um, it's very foreign for me to um, talk about what I've done, you know, making a list of here are the things that I've accomplished this year, because it's like, I wrote a play. That's all I do, right? That's what I know how to do. But if, if I think back and I'm like, well, there's 875 ways that I've reached out to the theater, I've had conversations with the board, I've, you know, represented, um, Programming. Um, I've been a liaison. I directed, you know, for readings. Uh, uh, I helped put together a fundraiser. So, I my challenge is keeping track of all the ways that I am integrating and being integrated into the theater. Um, that's something that I want to learn to be better at. Um, and it's also a question of interrogating, right? Because I come to the office and it's like, how do I work? And how do I talk to people about how I work, right? And it's just, you know, if I, have I been to the theater three times a week or four times a week or I was away last week and do I have to talk to people about where I was last week? It's a, it's a, a process of understanding who I am uh, uh, as, a, as a shy, personal, private writer and also like, in the world as a Mellon Fellow. So finding that balance and that sometimes th there's a tension there. So figuring that out has been part of my journey. Um, and then the other thing I'll say is that um, having, over the course of this year, ha having had the support of an institution like, personally um, and financially has been really good. Um, um, that's been good. <laughs> so good. Um, the, the only thing that I just sort of really want to add, it was so interesting earlier, you know, hearing from Pearl about like the, the, the dynamic of of the, the reminder that the art comes first. You know, and as someone who's like ingrained in every detail, you know, every day to day, um, the budgets, the, the you know, all the, all the planning, the board stuff. Um, it's been so amazing having that reminder every couple days that, that actually I'm an artist first um, and that the art, and like therefore the art has to come forth first. And I think the thing that where I'm really trying to implement that and where like I think what we want to continue to do is I do a lot of work with the, the young um, the, the young folks who work at our theater, we have an internship program. Um, uh, that group of 15, 20 people, whatever it is, that meets every other week, that, that we always talk about the art first. We actually start all our meetings talking about what play, what play we're working on and why we're working on it. Um, and I think that, that that has been really shifting the core of, of a lot of what some of those, um, the next generation of, of theater administrators is how they're thinking. Um, I think that that's been really exciting. Oh, I just wanted to add one more thing, too, in terms of, you know, having freedom to develop and pursue what I'm interested in. You know, one of the things that I was most excited about the residency was that I wouldn't have to teach as much. And then, you know, the second thing I did was, <laughs> I'm going to start a class. Um, but so, you know, I, I really, I realized that I really wanted to sit in a room with actors 
And I've had actors who I loved approach me and say, I'm oh, teaching how to write a play, I want to write a play. You know, and so accumulating over time, so I said, all right, I'm going to teach a play for, a class for actors, playwriting class for actors. And it turned out to be so um, fertile and enriching and so much fun to sit in a room and not have the expectation of, you know, you're the professor, I'm just one of them, and we're sitting in a room, we're creating work together, and so they're bringing in material, and they're writing monologues for themselves, and they're creating solo performance for themselves, they're writing themselves 10-minute plays. Um, and it, it, it was so much fun that we said, we have to do it again. And, and, and that also came from me, so feeling reinvigorated and um, recommitted to um, one kind of education, which is um, for my peers and for um, uh, um, artists who are exploring, developing their own artistic voice in a different medium, perhaps. Um, and I'm, you know, I feel like that is gonna, that's just gonna keep generating us. Uh, I think that's going to go on forever, right? Because of Mel and I can basic, practically offer the class for free. You know, the Huntington pays for the the room, and you know, I don't I don't get paid because Mel is paying my salary, and so um, the diversity um, of both socioeconomic, um, huge range in ages of the actors who are in the class, um, all different kinds of performers. Um, uh, you know, that's, that's been a really um, nice surprise and a different way of getting, um, getting the furnace, you know, fired up again, getting me excited to go and work on material. So, throw that out as well. Gary? Yeah, uh, Aditi and I have uh, known each other uh, personally and professionally for 20 years uh, as an actor, as a director, as a playwright. I would say, you know, we, our families spend holidays together. My daughter is a ring bearer at a wedding. It's a deep and long relationship. And I would say that our professional MO is progress through conflict. We, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we have a culture that uh, values honesty, self-criticism, and dissent. And in every conversation we have, we embody all three of those. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, in the uh, so just to sort of top cutting ball that uh, a week after uh, Aditi's residency began, we went into rehearsal for a trilogy of plays by Aditi. So no two and a half months. It was seven. Months. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we produced that trilogy. This plays Tindu God, which has gone on and has I think six or eight other productions subsequently. Um, and in the course of that year, in the course of that first year. Uh, Aditi uh, directed a theater for young audience show that she'd written. Uh, she actually stepped into a role for a weekend uh, when an actor had a health issue. Uh, she brought a play to the table that we will uh, do this season. She's going to direct another play uh, this season. Um, she has an office. Uh, you know, one of the things that happened is we had, uh, at the end of the rehearsal period for that trilogy, uh, which had been commissioned and in the works, I have to admit, for several years before the week before the rehearsals began. <laughs> uh, but she said it was great to have money at a time when normally a playwright doesn't get paid during the rehearsal period of a world premiere, there was pay for that. And, and while that was great for Aditi and a good lesson to learn, we actually built into the budgets for future world premieres money for the playwright during the rehearsal period. So it's something good that is because of the residency. Um, and, you know, one of the things that we also agreed upon was Mixed Blood had a lot of great stories to tell and we weren't telling them well. And so a key role uh, was that Aditi, Aditi was going to be the storyteller, was going to be the voice, uh, create a character and a narrative for the organization so we could tell our story through the media and social media. And so those are a lot of the good things that sort of continue to uh, embody our artistic relationship. We have a disability library that we're curating to try to change the relationship between the American theater and disability. But on the other hand, when it came to, uh, we have this unresolved tension, and it's significant, about this role of resident playwright versus staff and what does embedded mean. And it's to the point this artistic home of 20 years is, I, I feel, something we need to work through. And because we know how to argue well, I'm sure we will, but it actually is uh, something that uh, needs 
needs to get worked on. That what, what makes a person a staff? What isn't an embedded playwright? What is a playwright in residence? How are we doing that? And a year later, and we agreed a year ago when we started that we were going to do it for a year and rediscuss it. We're going to rediscuss it after this convening. Um, but it, it is still an issue to be resolved. That is it. I'm the only one That's speaking for next time. Playwrights, too? Yeah, I could go on. Yeah. Um, you know, when uh, Outrageous Fortune came out, a lot of our internal conversation at Playwrights Horizons was how to um, improve the playwriting experience within the, the production context for all playwrights and how to think about how, how to think about making an experience for, the, for writers that all writers felt in some degree in residence and uh, that there was a, a transparency and a, a, you know the whole theater's orientation towards the writer coming in is that they're the you know there's the star of the show for the next three months um, so the opportunity to apply for an actual residency in some ways um, was perfect timing for us because we were embarking upon a strategic campaign to help uh, um, develop some initiatives to this regard, initiatives that would put more money into the hands of playwrights faster, increase the engagement of the playwright with the community, uh, but not just that, also create some risk capital for the organization to try to, for example, uh, enable us to, to develop and produce musicals without you know, uh, extracting ourselves from the poisonous enhancement game that so many of us feel we have to be part of. And, uh, and also just to create some institutional, uh, um, well, frankly, to create a, a building reserve fund. And, um, and also to make better use of our space, to, to take a step back from renting our spaces whenever there was a vacancy to be, make better use of that. So um, part of that strategic campaign has been, you know, we've had a subcommittee, and Dan has been a really key member of those conversations. He's come to all these uh, uh, committee meetings, talking about ways to develop all these initiatives. He's gone to uh, several, several uh, board meetings. And um, you know, so there's been real value to the institution of having him there. Uh, frankly, in, in the spirit of what Howard said, I think he would have completely justified and deserved his residency if all he had done was what he did early on in the residency, which was drive with me to Philadelphia and see booty candy. And <laughs> afterwards drive back, I'm like, that was great. And Dan's like, yeah. And I'm like, I should produce that. And Dan's like, yeah, you should. <laughs> and I'm like, on the main stage. And he goes, yeah, it's comedy. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, there's that. <laughs> that happened too. But I think, you know, most importantly, and all of these is how have we how has the residency helped the writer work? And you know, although the mutuality is important, hopefully it does not in any way present an encumbrance to that uh, artist to create work. And um, maybe you can just talk about what you've been doing from the artistic side, like how you've used the residency. Yeah. I mean I've been like writing a play, which is, you know, like David's saying, like that's my job. So I've been I've been writing. Uh, it's been great <laughs> workshopping this play, um, and I've been workshopping, and it's been, you know, Ferris Horizons has been like a home base as I've gone off to do work uh, elsewhere as well. Um, what else? And I've, I've been a part of creating this panel series that actually Robert's about to take part in for Booty Candy. Uh, they are playwright-led, um, like, post-show discussions where we ask the playwrights to come up with their sort of, like, dream panel of uh, just intellectuals, artists, thinkers from uh, other fields besides the theater. Sometimes there are some theater people that find their way onto the panels, but it's been um, a pretty compelling and inspiring project so far. And uh, I don't know, it's been a highlight for me just getting to work with the staff. It's been pretty great. You know, we'll get into more, more things later. But it's been wonderful. 
Done. Done. Yeah. Um, so I think that that ends our um, our live streaming. Uh, so um, the camera will now be off for uh, the rest of our time together. <laughs> 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 <laughs>